All right, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our session. We're going to be talking about availability and recoverability principles in cloud architectures. So to introduce ourselves, my name is Rebecca Fitzhugh. Um, you can contact me on the internet via that. And please only send funny pictures, no questions. Um, <laughs> Do you want to introduce my, yourself? My name is Chris Williams. Uh, I'm a AWS Solutions Architect and a VCIX. I work for uh, GreenPages. My name is Mike Burkhart. I'm a Senior Solutions Architect at AHEAD. And uh, I like being fancy in my picture, obviously, uh, alludes to that. I get pictures every single time he's in a hotel room of him in a robe. And I don't know how to unsubscribe, so if somebody knows. I'm just going to block his phone number. <laughs> um, so to start off, we wanted to discuss the difference between availability and recoverability, because they sound the same. Uh, and a lot of times we see them get confused, especially like for me, when I'm reviewing VCDX designs for people who I'm mentoring, I, I will read them and, and they always should say availability and recoverability met. They always are grouped together, but they're two separate things. So what is availability? Availability is something should fail and you don't notice, right? So I could have potentially a host fail and you'd never know. I should be able to have potentially a VM fail and you don't know, a NIC fail, an HBA fail, even to the site level. I could potentially have an entire site fail and you don't know, right? So when we start thinking about high levels of availability, this becomes very, very expensive, right? Especially at a site level because now you're looking at active active sites, you're looking at global load balancing, right? Synchronous replication and we're seeing the price tag go up and up and up, okay? So recoverability, on the other hand, this is something has failed, there is potentially an impact and now I need to recover from that. And so ease of recoverability becomes a very important thing, especially in the event of disaster. Um, we all know what's happening right now in Houston, right? So what if your main data center is in Houston and it's overtaken by water or you've lost power? How do I recover from that? You may not have an active active site where it just fails over and everything's golden. This may be something that you have to manually do or you may have to hit the button, right, and have it happen in an automated fashion, okay? So the difference is, is there notice or not from the end user perspective, right? So recoverability is now I need to go and recover from backup or I need to fail over the sites, okay? Whereas with availability, that's going to happen automatically, if you will, right? So with respect to recoverability in the cloud, starting with failures and how do we recover from a failure? Um, many of us have, show of hands, who's dealt with tape archives, tape libraries? Oh, a lot of happy customers. Um, you we all, all that old, right? <laughs> tape oh, old. Come on. Uh, so, with respect to uh, tape, or tape archives, you know, we all know that we can throw an LTO drive in the bay, take a backup, take that tape, hopefully hand it off to somebody in a truck, and cross your fingers never see it again, right? If you do, something happens. Um, with respect to the cloud, there's no truck. It's actually all virtual, right? So at this point, we're looking at sending just the data off-site. And in this example, we have uh, VTL, so virtual tape library, being able to replicate your data from any tape library or uh, archive off-site into the cloud, into any bucket. But extrapolate that. So take that out into get your data off-site into the cloud by any means, right? So whatever replication mechanism you can take, if it's just you know, replicating just a database or data set, or if it's an entire virtual machine to some sort of instance, that's gonna be your basis of recovery, right? And how often you do that and how much data that's replicated is gonna depend on your business SLAs, right? RPO, RTO, and ensuring that those are met. So, onto a, a different type of mechanism. So, in the first case, we saw VTL just for data. Here, we're actually looking at more of an application stack. Um, with Pilot Light, you're looking at replicating data that's going to form the foundation of that application stack, and you're also going to have a web and app tier that's kind of ready to go, but they're not powered on. So you're not paying money for those instances in the cloud for running, but that data is still there. So you have the ability to form up that stack very quickly with near live data. Hopefully it's somewhat synchronous, but depending on where that data is located and how quickly you can get it there, et cetera. Um, so what you're going to do is end up failing one side. That could be your on-premises data center, premises. Um, and <laughs> and uh, on the other side, you know, maybe we're in the cloud, maybe we're in another data center. It could be private cloud, could be hybrid instance, et cetera. So now you see that we've spun up the pilot light and we have web app and data tier all operating as normal. So this is effectively our production environment and we have not paid that extra money in the meantime for those standby, so to speak, right? So it's basically a cold standby configuration. Um, with respect to that, 
uh, Chris is actually going to go into more about the availability portion of in the cloud and having that readily available in the case of a failure with no impact. Okay. So the um, the distinction between the war the pilot light um, model and the warm standby model is that the pilot light model, your your in, in this example your web stack and your application stack are spun down. In a warm standby, you have a smaller but fully functional environment running up in your cloud environment that that is exactly analogous to your your on-premises environment. Um, the the warm standby model, what happens in during the, in the event of failure, your DNS either automatically or manually cuts over to your cloud environment. Some form of automatic scaling inflates and, and adds uh, additional instances to the front end. So for your web environment, you would want to um, you would want to increase your environment horizontally. For the back end, for your database, you want to increase your environment vertically, depending upon which kinds of databases you're using and, and what kind of web stack you're using. And so what this does is this gives you the ability to have a smaller footprint in the cloud, but still fully functional. So you would still have your Active Directory tier up there. The failure happens, everything flips over, your FISMO rolls go up to your cloud. For the for the multi-site, and this is this is the the final. What we've done is we've iterated from the the backup to the pilot light to the warm standby to the multi-site, and and as you increase as you go across the scale of recoverability to availability, you're also increasing your cost. This is your fully redundant on-premises environment with an environment up in the cloud that can fully support in the event of a disaster, everything failing over, and and no need to add, add additional workloads. In this model, your on-premises application servers can actually take a look at your databases in your, in your cloud DR environment um, as from, from a read perspective. Your databases are still being replicated over to your cloud environment, um, whether synchronously or asynchronously, building on, on what Mike and Rebecca were talking about. And in this environment, the failure happens. You're already, you're already in a multi-site environment running active-active across DNS. In this, in this example, your DNS basically waits over to your new environment. Um, what, depending upon which DNS you're using, you, you, you wait automatically or can wait it manually, and your environment is, is already up and running, and nobody's noticed anything unless they're pinging an IP address. So to that point. We had 12 minutes, so we had to talk really fast and cut out a lot of really good content. But if you find that this topic is interesting, we're actually in the middle, of, we're about halfway through writing a book about business continuity, disaster recovery, and operational recovery as well. Uh, so that we're hoping that'll be out um, sometime next spring. What, There's what? a lot of editing and things, all right? <laughs> There's a lot of like things happening. Uh, and also he has to actually write a word. We're waiting on that. Um, oh, man, I wrote one. I wrote one word. He hasn't word. written anything. So with that, <laughs> if you have any questions, because we, we we're focusing mostly on design principles here. And so the same with the book. It's going to be written from an architect type perspective. Uh, so it's not going to be necessarily nitty gritty, nerd knob turning, okay, but from a high level architect point of view. So if you have any questions, we'll be out there. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.